Good evening. Um, I'm David Henke. I am a um, freelance uh, journalist who was a former journalist for um, over 30 years on the Guardian newspaper. Um, and I have um, covered a large um, number of issues from um, investigating um, uh, corrupt members of parliament, which is probably rather topical at the moment, um, uh, to uh, looking at social services, health, local government, and Whitehall. Um, I became involved um, in looking at the issue of women's rights when I was approached by Joanne Welsh, who uh, ran and runs still the Back to 60 campaign, um, which were involved in trying to right a really egregious wrong um, affecting women born in the 1950s, who suddenly found without really receiving proper notice from the government or even information from the government, that their pension was going to go up from 60 to 65 and then 66. This um, uh, change was actually uh, decided by the uh, government of um, John Major in the 1990s as, believe it or not, an equality measure because it was thought that women had too much of an advantage by um, retiring earlier at 60 than men at 65. On the surface, it looks like a straightforward equality measure. It was actually nothing of the sort. Um, and it caused a lot of hardship for women um, in their um, 60s, often who were not in the absolute best of health and who suddenly found themselves having to wait um, um, five and then six years to get a pension that they thought they were going to get um, 40 or 50 years previously. And when I was asked to look at this, I found it rather puzzling because there were three explanations why this had to be done. One was that actually uh, the government couldn't afford it anymore because two, because everybody was living longer and longer, and uh, three, that basically we had to um, introduce equality measures. What, of course, it did do was save huge, huge sums for the uh, Treasury in not having to pay out pensions for this particular group um, for up to six years. And that involved 3.8 million people, a lot of people. When I started investigating this, I found that everything they said about uh, why they needed to do this was untrue. They said there wasn't the money, but I discovered really to quite to my shock, and it had never really been uh, properly reported, that in 1988, um, 40 years after the Beveridge report came out and the welfare state was set up, the government decided that the Treasury would no longer pay a third of the money into the National Insurance Fund that they'd been doing for this long period. And that was because as well as people having a right of a, pay, a pension, um, it also covered um, unemployment benefit, now job seekers allowance, um, the uh, maternity benefit, Benefit, paternity benefit later on and sick pay. And instead, the government decided this would just be funded entirely from the existing national insurance contributions that were made every year and not from the government. This saved them a staggering £271 billion pounds over 24 years, because there was only about one year when they put any money into it. Um, this actually meant that um, the government had huge savings, people had to wait, 
And the argument was put, well, it's all right. The, um, the people are going to live longer and longer and we can't afford to pay out all this money to people at this time. Um, the truth was um, that the age life expectancy went up and continued going up, but only to 2011. When the cuts to the weight for pensions were introduced, they, um, it stalled. And not only has it now stalled, but it's now fallen because of COVID-19. So this premise that, one, we haven't got the money to do it, and two, that where our pensions are uh, basically we can't afford to pay out for so long, were no longer true. The third reason really was, oh, well, this is an equality matter. It's not fair that men retire at six, 65 and women can retire at 60. The truth of the matter was, though, it was not a level playing field. Women in this particular area um, basically didn't have the same chance to build up national insurance contributions as men. And in fact, by various laws at various stages, they were actually prevented from um, basically applying for national insurance because they didn't earn enough money or they were bringing up children and they weren't there to in work, whereas men tended, unless they were unlucky enough to uh, hit by a bout of unemployment, to have a steady uh, working record, which easily covered the, um, uh, the uh, rules for getting a pension. And frankly, um, although Back to 60 thought this was really wrong, and they won permission um, by um, uh, uh, Mrs. Justice Lang to challenge this in the courts. And they are through a judicial review. And this was interesting because her ruling was that, rather like I've said, that actually women hadn't really realised this was happening because the department made no real attempt until far too late to actually inform women personally that they were going to have to wait much longer for their pension. But they ended up um, having to uh, but basically um, uh, uh, not having as the same play the rights and she said um, that this even though it had happened 15 years ago the effects were now and therefore we should be urgently done uh, sorted out unfortunately judges in the um, court of appeal, the court the high court and the court of appeal disagreed and actually wouldn't accept this and the supreme court went one step further saying well we don't even want to hear it which was, uh, to my mind, a grave, grave injustice to the women's concern. Now, the sad failure of the uh, to get this done and get the rights for all these women who were basically entitled to the full restitution of their pension um, meant that nothing was really um, uh, that basically people started to look at a wider issue. Why are women? Actually, well, is this the only case that women are involved? No, it isn't. And actually, this led to a, a very important tribunal, um, the CEDAW Tribunal, which basically was all forms of um, discrimination against women and girls um, to, um, to, to basically to hold this tribunal so people could actually um, discuss the much wider issues that were affecting women as well as pensions. And frankly, the lawyers on behalf of Back to 60 did try to use the seed or thing, but it got nowhere. And this made them more determined to say that, OK, we signed up to a convention to get rid of all discrimination. Uh, it was signed up by Margaret Thatcher as long ago as 1986. But actually, how large swathes of it aren't in law. And there's a need for a proper law to really well properly implement this for women. Now, I can give, give you quite a number of quite important examples. It's not just the pensions issue. 
as far as the Department for Work and Pensions and actually um, uh, Revenue and Customs as well are concerned, this discrimination over um, pensions, which has not been righted yet, applies to lots of other things in Social Security. For instance, widows who get a pension lose it if they remarry. And there are even cases of women who basically can't remarry someone else they meet because they might be earning less than them because their pension is just taken away at that point. Uh, that's one example. Uh, women also were entitled through um, a guaranteed minimum pension arrangement to inherit money um, that basically their um, spouse and partner had paid in, uh, or, or even when they had out opted out, they were supposed to be guaranteed a certain level of money. And that is not available either. And the department hasn't even informed people about uh, what this loss means. Um, one, one could also add one or two other um, examples where um, as far as social security and uh, benefits and and actually tax position um, affects women in another another way. I've recently, um, through um, a, a woman campaigner taking this up, um, discovered that um, uh, the new laws that came in in 2013 that ended really child benefit as a universal benefit for all women and, um, and it was meant to go mainly to the woman as well. Um, basically people who earn more than 60,000 or if their husband earns more than 60,000 don't get it. Um, what they didn't tell people when this was introduced for about, as far as I can see, six years, was that if a woman, therefore, over, over, earning over 60,000 thought, well, it's not worth applying for this money, they um, basically couldn't get, um, that they basically wouldn't get credits towards their pension because they had to apply for something that were going to be refused to get actually credits, which could be as long as 10 years for, or oh, 12 years actually, um, for um, towards their pension. If they, did, if they didn't apply, they didn't get it. And it's only, as far as I can see from last April, that they've stuck this on the form. Even worse than that, there was a provision that, that many not so well off um, grandparents and close relatives who decided to help them out with childcare, sometimes so they could go back to work, uh, at least part time, if not more, were also entitled to national insurance credits towards their pensions. But if the person didn't apply, in other words, the mother didn't, thought it wasn't worth applying, they didn't get it either. And this, this is just uh, sort of an example, really, of the amount of the scale of discrimination just in the social security area, which actually mainly, again, affects women. I mean, not entirely, but nevertheless does affect women more than anything else. Now, if we look wider than this whole issue, you will find that, um, that basically there are, there are stack loads of issues that um, women are basically not, are not properly protected. For example, the whole business about violence against women and where there's been recently horrific case where a, uh, a serving policeman off duty um, kidnapped and murdered a woman just walking home one evening. Um, this whole area is not really uh, properly addressed. And, and again, the women trying to bring cases where there's been violence or domestic brute abuse are in a much more difficult position to bring the case. It is improving with the domestic abuse bill and now, an act, now coming an act um, to provide more support and help and try and re 
redress the balance. But this has been a long fight lasting over years. And also the issue about violence uh, against women. Um, the government has only just decided that if you are basically a shop worker, if you actually are doing um, public work where you're facing the public, providing public services, or um, you know, whether you're a train ticket collector or um, basically dealing with the public all the time, they've only just decided to make it an aggravated offence if someone violently attacks them, uh, whatever member of the public does. And this is taken, I think, the union, um, USDOR, which represents shop workers, decays to actually get put into legislation. And again, this is an issue that mainly more affects women who work in shops than men. Um, and actually, I'm glad to say the government is also going to um, apply to cover a, um, a new um, uh, international labour organisation agreement um, convention that's only about two or three years old um, to actually um, provide protection of violence uh, from people who are being treated badly, violently at work, uh, either in the workplace by other people or by people they're dealing with. Um, but again, this has taken ages and it's um, similarly, um, uh, if I look at whole other areas that are not uh, where women are being still left behind years and years after things are meant to be right. Most people would think, oh, surely we have equal pay for women now. No, we don't, because agreements uh, have often been meant to leave this to phase in for years and years. Employers say it's too expensive to do this, and uh, uh, things go wrong in that area. And again, the law, the law is not strong enough to actually force this through and give people rights, because after all, women are half the population. A lot of them are, are actually at work and basically there shouldn't be a, a single issue about women not being paid exactly the same as a man for doing a job and it shouldn't have to be fought case by case you know whether it's um, arguments in supermarkets or or other for other jobs um, for for this to be implemented. It should be a given. Now the other thing that is quite um, uh, sort of significant is that um, if you look at um, job opportunities for women, um, theory, we, it should all be an equal opportunities situation and women should be able to do any job as a man. And yes, they are more women lawyers, they're more women policemen, they're, they're more um, uh, people uh, sort of uh, taking on the far, uh, women firefighters as well, uh, taking on, on jobs. But it's a painfully small process. Um, I'll give you an example. We are told at the moment that Britain has a national, serious national housing shortage, and there needs to be a massive increase in house building and provision of homes, because basically a lot of people are being priced out of the market, particularly young people can't get uh, homes because they can't afford it. They aren't enough round. It's all based on supply and demand. Not enough affordable homes have been built. Now, you may say, what's well, about how does it affect women? Well, what's really interesting, the House of Lords this week did a what are the problems in actually doing and what's it disclosed a whole lot of things but one of the amazing things it disclosed is the percentage of women working in constru the construction industry and that also includes civil engineers quantity surveyors as well as what people see as normal or uh, male occupations like bricklayers and plasterers um, the percentage of women employed in that industry is a pathetic four percent 
In other words, it's a 96% male dominated industry. Now you would expect in some trades um, uh, where this, this will be natural case, but that is an obvious um, area that shows that where, which is going to be expanded a lot to meet the demand. There's a, there is actually a shortage of 217,000 people in the construction industry at the moment, which is one thing that's holding back the building of homes as well as the supply of materials uh, but you would think that women should actually have a much much bigger say in it and that is really uh, uh, a good example of um, how actually women still are not reaching the top the same applies actually in a lot of the top uh, echelons of jobs. I mean, there are now more women permanent secretaries than there used to be. Um, there are more women MPs, but still by no means uh, an equal number to men. Um, they are still, uh, they are more women judges and more um, women um, uh, sort of, uh, women in uh, women barristers and uh, and in, in other areas actually but women are still actually seen as um, uh, an area where actually um, they do more lower paid jobs I mean classically what people would call say in common parlance uh, dinner ladies, um, sort of um, uh, some of them junior nurses, um, a whole lot of professions that are not the best paid are dominated by women. And again, shop assistants. That I, that I, so actually the equality issue has not been addressed. And that is a really, um, really something that is quite wrong. Because women, as I've said before, I think actually make up a tiny majority, 51% of, of, the, uh, of the percentage of people, uh, you know, living, working here. And they basically do not have by any means the equality of the, the, uh, that they should have. Now, now, the question is, people would probably ask, well, why? Why is it such a struggle every time for women to get, you know, a few more MPs, um, a few extra jobs here and there, get promotion up to uh, the top jobs in some of uh, the industries and so on we have? Um, and the answer really is, the law. And that's why I am a passionate supporter of a, a women's bill of rights. Because if you think about it, think of the struggle that um, Back to 60 had to do to try and get um, um, you know, some uh, equality into the payment of pensions. Think of the years that had to be spent fighting for, you know, um, protection, a lot for women of shop workers. <laughs> Think of um, quite a lot of areas where um, it's, it's a long bit, case by case, you can't sort of do. Now, if we had a Women's Bill of Rights that implemented this convention properly rather than the half-baked Equalities Act, which helps in, in, in cases, but it hasn't got a comprehensive overview. There will be a transformation in this country because the moment any of those issues I raised up, whether it was some discriminatory construction company or whether it's um, um, a failure to um, you know, provide equal uh, services and equal benefits to people. Um, if we have a framework of law that basically says no, no all, all discrimination is eliminated for women, you're starting from that. It should mean that the cases can be bought much more quickly should mean that the courts would have to take action to do something to get this done. It should mean that you shouldn't have to wait decades to get equal pay, you should get it within a year. <laughs> and why not? Because it's obviously wrong um, that, that there is this huge difference. So I, I, that's why I want to see this, because I started the beginning talking about how I got involved in, you know, uh, what was a grave injustice for three point. 
uh, 8 million women over pensions. But then it became clear to me that this is not an isolated story, that, you know, it's always a bit sad this group have got this attack, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we'll deal with that separately and not relate eat it to the rest of society. Well, I mean, I was, that's why I think and why I absolutely support a really thorough, big change in the culture of this country. And the law is often the best way to do this, because once it's law, it's law. And you might argue about the detail, but you're going to have to agree to a um, uh, to to a, to a big change. And without this, it's still going to go on on in individual cases on this, that, and the other. Um, um, and have it, and people are going to have to fight like rather the women, the suffragettes, had to fight to get the vote, uh, but they didn't get. Then it weren't given a seat. Or then, <laughs> no, if they had, we might have a completely different society. Um, but um, the, the truth is that, we, that without this overall thing, and it's quite a difficult concept to grasp, yeah, but once you've grasped it, then everything else will fall into place. And women will, will I think, move by leaps and bounds to play a much bigger role in um, British society than they do now. And that people who still... Uh, sort of want to stop it will find themselves in a minority and to, the thing I am pleased to see is that the that Nicola Sturgeon seems to get it in Scotland because they're talking about implementing a law that will do this and also the Welsh government is talking about doing something along this lines as well. It's the English that are I'm afraid dragging their feet and it's quite clear that Boris Johnson um, the, if he still continues to be in office, is no great fan of uh, expanding rights for women. And also, while we're talking about it, ethnic minorities, children and disabled people. So um, in my view, um, we absolutely must have this. And it gets the full picture and people need to grasp this because once we've got it, the world will change and it will change for the better and we might actually also have a, a more caring as well as a competitive society in this country rather than something that is wallowing in um, nostalgia about the past but actually looking for a far far better future for women uh, than they have now so bring on the Women's Bill of Rights and let's get it done.